All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. Those who might be new to what we do at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms uh, across North America and beyond. So the school year is kicked off now. We'll be hosting 30, 40, even 50 live events a month for classrooms to join in. So check out Exploring by the Seat. Com. Now, today is a really special day. Uh, the 22nd of September is World Rhino Day. So all day long, we've been traveling around the world, talking to scientists, talking to conservationists, uh, talking to explorers and filmmakers, and learning all about the five species of rhinos, the threats they face, and then, of course, learning all about the champions who are working so hard uh, to protect them and save them from extinction. So I can't believe it. We've had uh, five live events. We're at our final live event for the day, but we just could not end today without giving a little love to the greater one horned rhino. So I'm so thrilled uh, to be joining the Toronto Zoo. We love our live events with the Toronto Zoo. We've got Mary Ellen on the camera. We've got Angie uh, up front with the rhinos, and we're going to learn all about this species and get a chance to ask some questions. So those tuning in live via YouTube, uh, feel free to start commenting. I see the comments racking up already. Let us know where you're watching from, send in some questions, we'll work those in. But Angie, I wanna throw things over to you to introduce yourself. We're so excited to have you joining us on World Rhino Day. Thank you, Joe. I am super excited to be here, guys. Happy World Rhino Day. It's my favorite day of the whole year. We have two rhinos here for you to meet currently. We do have three at the Toronto Zoo. Uh, this is our mom rhino. Her name is Asha. She just turned 16 years old last week. And here beside her little guy, his name is Kieran. And Kieran is only two and a half years old. He's the second calf born to our rhino pair. Dad is in a different exhibit um, because this species is considered a solitary species. And that means that they don't live together naturally in the wild. They like to be by themselves. The only time you'll find multiple greater one-horned rhinos uh, together is in this kind of a situation where you have a mom and a baby. Occasionally in the wild, um, females can hang out together and they can feed or wallow together um, fairly peacefully, but for the most part, they like to live on their own. Now, dad is 17 years of age. Here you go. Here you go. So that's our greater one horn rhino family here at the zoo. Mom, dad, and kiddo. Can't even call him a baby. He's only two and a half, but as you can see, he's almost the same height as his mom. Very cool. I can see they love those carrots. They do. They actually uh, are super food motivated, these guys. Um, greater one horn rhinos are considered to be a browsing species and a grazing species. So that means that they love to eat grass, which we feed them as much as they want in the form of hay. And they also love to eat trees and bushes. Um, just so happens here in a zoo setting, they also can get some delicious treats. And we usually use these treats for behind the scenes tours uh, or for training, because we do do a lot of training with our rhinos. So this is just a nice, fun um, treat to reward them with. So they get carrots, they get melons. Okay, slow down, don't make yourself sick, my goodness. Uh, this kid loves to eat. Uh, today they've got peaches. Often it's apples, and they also get a romaine lettuce. So just fun things throughout the day to feed them, as well as to use for training. It makes a nice treat. But what they do really love, as I said, these guys are browsers. And especially in the summertime, they love to eat fresh browse. Now at the Toronto Zoo, we're actually designed zoo geographically. So that means um, the area I work in is the Indo-Malaya section of the zoo. Uh, and that encompasses where these guys are from. Greater one-horned rhinos are found in northeastern um, India and in Nepal. And they basically all live in protected uh, conservancies or forests that are monitored. So we actually, having an indoor building, we have a lot of natural uh, plants and vegetation that grow in that building that is endemic to these areas. So it's super fun when they do a big pruning because the plants get too tall for the building. Uh, the rhinos love it. They are the benefactors of all of this delicious and natural browse for them. Now they do also love Canadian browse as well. We have a lot of trees on site and in the summertime our horticulture department is busy pruning trees and um, they love to eat willow and they also eat a lot of poplar. Apple is a special treat. They don't get that too often. There are other species on site that need the apple browse, 
Um, but occasionally we do get some and they, and they do really like that too. Now, a few years ago, our nutrition department embarked upon a silage program and the rhinos have really benefited from that as well. We only were able to give browse fresh in the summer times. As you know, up here in the Northern climate, we don't have many leaves on trees in the winter. Um, so our nutrition uh, folks have figured out a way by which to package the browse and they're actually able to store it uh, for us. And it's basically called silage and silage is a process where they can cut the tree branches into sections, they mash it all into a barrel, all the air uh, is pushed out of it, and then it's sealed tight and left to ferment. And so that what that does is that allows us to have these barrels, giant barrels of um, silage browse to feed them in the winter. And that has been amazing for these guys because eating trees, believe it or not, is super important for their health. Not only their overall well-being, but their dental health as well. Rhinos, these rhinos were designed to eat trees and bushes. and not just the leaf part, as you can see. They've done an excellent job at eating the stick part too, which they can crunch up easily with no problem. Mom will probably show you that. She eats sticks a little bit bigger than Kieran does here. I'll give him one more his speed. All right, Angie, so awesome. This is so cool. Um, can, can you, you tell me? us a little bit about what their natural habitat is like and what their status is. Are they threatened? Are they endangered? So currently they're considered to be vulnerable and the greater one horned rhino is actually an amazing success story for rhino conservation. Um, back in the very early 1900s, these guys were poached almost to the point of extinction where there was only about 200 remaining. So since the early 1900s, uh, we've managed to increase their wild population up to about 3,500 animals. And while these guys don't live in the wild, we've contributed even right here at the Toronto Zoo by having these two calves with the family that we have, Oops, sorry. And uh, the previous pair that we had before them were able to produce three calves. So the Toronto Zoo has actually contributed to the overall population of greater one-horned rhinos by contributing five Canadian babies. So that's something that we're actually very proud of, but it is an amazing success story. Uh, 3,500 is not very many, however, so they definitely still need our help. They still need to have space uh, in order to live. And that's one of the biggest problems affecting them right now where they live, which, as I said, is um, northern East India and in Nepal. And a lot of the problem greater one horn rhinos are facing is just lack of habitat. There's a lot of human um, wildlife conflict as the population of humans grow. They need a place to live. They need areas to farm. And they're going into these um, um, and natural forests and actually trying to live in this environment. And unfortunately, that's where the rhinos and tigers and other animals live. And ultimately, uh, you know, humans and animals don't always live together all the time, especially when you're competing for space. It's one of the problems that these guys are facing currently. All right. Well, Angie. Um, Looking this morning, we, we met a few other rhino species, particularly the black and the white, and their skin looks very different. It almost looks like the greater one horn has armor plating, almost the way the skin's put together. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So they're not unique. Uh, the other species of rhino that has skin similar is the javan rhino. And the javan rhino and the greater one horn rhino are fairly closely related. They do look a little different, um, but the skin, as you can see, kind of looks like dinosaurs or armored plates. They've got these extra folds here and they've got a bunch around their neck and at their hip where the black rhinos and white rhinos, those guys are nice and smooth. They don't even have all these nubbly bumps. Now, no one actually knows why rhinos or greater one horn rhinos are designed this way, but there's a very good theory. And I'll see if I can get Kieran's head back over here and I'm gonna show you two little teeth that he has in the front of his mouth. If he stops chewing here, you can see this little tooth. Ash, are you gonna come and show me your teeth? Anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, greater one horn rhinos are unique in that they have two teeth on their bottom jaw. Now he's just got little wee ones, see right there? Because he's just a baby, but his dads are full grown. And those teeth are about this big and they are razor sharp. The white rhinos and black rhinos of Africa use their horns for fighting and defense. They can actually hook those horns underneath the rhino, flip them right upside down. The guy who's standing is the winner. These rhinos, one horn, not very big, 
Um, Kieran's is still growing, but if you look at Ash's, hers is fully grown and not very impressive. Um, they don't use their they don't use their horns for fighting though. One day he's gonna use these great big teeth when they get big. And they actually gore each other uh, to fight. And this particular species of rhino is very territorial. Sorry, you're hungry, oh my goodness. Uh, and as I said, they're a solitary species. So there's a lot of fighting for territory and especially if there's multiple adult males tracking a female if she's in heat. So they gore each other with those teeth. They're razor sharp. So the thought is, is that by having these extra skin flanges at the neck and over your uh, front leg and your back leg, you're probably helping to protect some very important organs. So if you're in a big fight, you want your jugular vein protected. And that's where this hard skin up at his neck is going to come in handy. The flap that's over his front leg is probably going to help protect his heart and his lungs. Oh, this is fun. And the flap at the back um, is gonna help with kidney and liver protection. Now, again, no one knows for sure, but there is a good, uh, it's a pretty good theory. Here's another example of how sharp that tooth is. You might notice that Ash there has a bit of a knob kind of hanging off of her side where Kieran does not. So once upon a time, Ash's back flap looked like that. But during a breeding attempt with the male, um, it is very hectic and there's a lot of chasing involved. And he managed to just kind of swing his head and he sliced through her just like butter. That's how sharp that tooth is. Um, so anyway, one thing that's amazing about rhinos is they do heal very, very quickly. So it took no time to heal that up, but she now just kind of has that memory of that breeding uh, with that dangly blob there. There you go, have some more. So razor sharp teeth, but that is the thought process behind having the extra bumps and folds uh, is just the aggression that they have with each other. All right, so we just got kind of treated to a little view of, of one of them on the move. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how they move. Are they pretty fast? It looks like they could maybe get up to some good speed. Sorry, I totally didn't catch that. <laughs> They're making a ton of noise. That's okay. Um, it, we just saw one kind of go by pretty quickly. Are they pretty oh, fast? Yes. Can they get up to a pretty good speed? They can. They can actually run up to 55 kilometers an hour. Um, I, I, won't, I don't know what that is in miles. Apologies. Uh, less. No, I don't know. I can't take a guess. Anyway, uh, they can run very quickly for short periods of time. Um, so it's not something that they can maintain a good speed at, but if they need to flee or if they need to chase something down, they certainly can move. Um, which is pretty amazing when you think about a 4,000 pound animal running, uh, it's very impressive. And I've seen these guys, even in our exhibit during the breeding attempts, there's a lot of chasing and they're running fast enough that all four feet are galloping just like a horse. And they're basically off the ground, not being touched. Um, but again, it's not something that they do for great speeds or long time. Uh, they're pretty heavy, so they get tired quickly. These guys, you might have noticed as she ran by, though, her head was very upright, her ears were forward. So one thing everyone needs to know about rhinos, they have terrible vision. And if you look at their face, it's actually the smallest feature they have. So it kind of makes sense that they don't work so well compared to her nostrils, which are huge, and her ears. So these guys have an excellent sense of smell and excellent sense of hearing. So when she's in that alert mode, she's listening and she's smelling because she can't really see what's off in the distance too well. If they feel threatened, they're gonna turn and face the threat. They're gonna listen with those ears in alert position. Her head is up and erect, making herself look bigger. And then if she needs to, she's gonna take off and charge in that direction, hoping to startle her, um, well, threat, whatever it is that is threatening to them. And that is actually one of the reasons why at zoos, or at least our zoo, um, we don't go in with our rhinos. They are considered to be a dangerous animal and mainly because of their size. Um, otherwise, I would consider them to be giant dogs. They love to be petted. They have uh, a lot of nerve endings and blood vessels right at the surface of their skin. So they do love being petted and even touching them lightly, they can feel it. Um, lost my train of thought, totally can't remember where I was going with that. Oh, giant dogs, but what did I say before that? Kids, help me. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, just looking at their horn, you can see it's, you know, it's quite small. So is poaching much of an issue? Is it more habitat loss, kind of the biggest threat that they're facing? So the greater one horn rhinos do face poaching threats. Um, you know, humans, everyone loves money. And unfortunately we know how much money horns are fetching on the black market. So there are, poachings recorded of the greater one-horned rhino. However, 
nothing compared to the black and white rhinos of Africa. And again, I think that's a dollars and cents thing. Um, also location. So these guys, as I said, live in India and Nepal, but they live in um, forests. They live in swampy areas. They love water. So they're gonna be in a habitat that's around water, which doesn't make it super accessible for poachers to get to. It's not super easy. Um, whereas the African rhinos, flat land as far as you can see. So, you know, seeing those rhinos, being able to track those rhinos are much easier. And then of course the big payoff. Ashley Kieran's horn is pretty much full grown. So as I said, it's not very impressive. And if you're looking to maximize the amount of money that you're getting, you're not gonna wanna waste time traipsing through the jungles of India, um, trying to find a greater one horned rhino. You're gonna wanna go to Africa. Those animals have two horns and they are massive. So you're definitely getting, I suppose, more bang for your buck by uh, poaching those guys. So I think the greater one horns are facing more of a threat that has to do with the human wildlife conflict, um, but poaching is, is a consideration for them as well. Okay. So there's a lot of skepticism on YouTube right now. If people think their teeth look so small. How can they, how can they crunch those big branches? <laughs> well, just like Ash is showing you, uh, I will do my best. Kieran here, we could come back to that in a minute as well when she's done chewing. He's not great at it, but we definitely will get him to try to open his mouth. This is a behavior that we are training to him. Maybe we'll wait till he's done chewing um, because it's important for us to also be able to look inside their mouths too, to know how their teeth are managing. Can you open up and show us all your big teeth? Open, way in the back. <laughs> His mom definitely does it better. She's got a long way to go on that stick boat. Open up. Get in there. Can you see these? <laughs> it's like, what? Doesn't want to do that today. <laughs> yeah, well, he's he's all about the eating. He's not super great at it, but I definitely remind me before we sign off, and I will uh, I will ask her. To, actually, let's see. Open. Do you want this browse? Open. Can you see in the back? There we go. Yeah, you can see a nice row along the back. Yeah. Hers will be better. We'll try her when she's done. Um, but yeah, being able to look inside that mouth is very important. It's not, just certainly don't put my hand in there um, just in case, but at least I'd be able to get an idea if something was going on. Um, and then we might need to call the dentist in or the vets in. All right. Well, I say we take a little bit of Q&A action from our live classrooms. Angie, what do you think? Absolutely. No, absolutely. And we'll wait for Ash to finish chewing and we'll see if we can see better teeth. All right. Perfect. So I do want to try and give a few shout outs. We have a huge group tuning in right now from all over the place. Um, do feel free to give us some more shout outs uh, in the chat sidebar. But obviously, we have lots of groups around Ontario that are joining us live. We have groups joining us live. Uh, in the US in places like North Carolina and Florida, uh, looks like Washington, California. Oh, so we've really? got, we even have viewers tuning in from India. So we have a great group that's tuning in live. So send in some more of those questions for us. Uh, let us know where you're viewing from as well. But we also have groups who are joining us live on camera as well. So I'm gonna go to our first group here. I'm gonna bring them into the stream. And there we go. This is Mrs. Thiessen's group, third and fourth graders. They are joining us uh, in British Columbia. So how are we doing today, everybody, in Surrey? We're great, thanks, Joe. How are we doing? You can say it, good. Very good. Awesome. It's our first time, Mrs. Kibosky. So we were wondering how much food do they eat in one day? Oh. Well, it's hard to kind of give a quantity exactly. Um, as I said, they're predominantly grazers. So they mostly eat grass. And that's our kind of rule of thumb is we feed them as much as they want to eat. Now, the hay that we get up here can vary. And these guys actually are really picky, believe it or not. Um, so sometimes we'll get shipments of hay that they love. And they easily could eat two bales per rhino. And if you think about a bale of hay being about this big, right? Um, they can eat two of those in a day by themselves. Then we add some more produce on top and they also get a supplemental pellet um, that the Toronto Zoo has designed. We get, have it made for us off site, but they uh, designed the um, formulation of it. And basically it's a, a cube that's ground up hay for the most part. And then um, we add vitamins and minerals because hay is basically dead grass. But these guys need the vitamins and minerals. Okay. 
um, they need the vitamins and minerals as part of their diet. So we add that to the cube and they love those cubes and they get a bunch of scoops a day. Um, so currently, uh, actually Kieran eats about four or 16 kilograms of those cubes a day on top of all of the hay and on top of the produce. You are obnoxious baby. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like they need a lot of attention. They do. Actually, this kid just doesn't stop eating, honestly. He is a giant pig who needs some more manners training. Um, what I'm hoping he'll do is just kind of line up here for a minute. And if he settles down, he'll actually get into a bit of a zone. And I'll, I'll be able to pet him, um, <laughs> which he does really like. There All right. Well, I'm getting a shout out uh, on YouTube. They like your belt. They think your belt oh, buckle is pretty cool. So... Um, my partner and I designed our own sort of company or uh, fundraising organization of sorts. Uh, when I started working with these guys, I didn't know anything about rhinos and um, they immediately captured my heart. I, I love them. They're absolutely amazing animals. I think a lot of people just kind of overlook them as giant, you know, gray lumps, um, but they actually have tons of personality and a lot of character. And honestly, they're like giant dogs. Um, if you can get petting them, if you would let me, uh, they have sweet spots. They love their tummies rubbed. And actually, he will just lay down and roll over for a belly rub if he's in the right mood. So I really, as I started to learn more about them, started learning more about the poaching and everything that's happening to them, which is, you know, just crazy. Um, I had to do more. What could I do to try to help educate Canadians or anyone who wanted to pay attention to me about what these guys are going through right now? All right. Uh, I'll give a few more shout outs, a few more groups introduced introduce themselves. Seattle, Vermont, Michigan, Utah, Maryland, Mississippi, West Virginia, uh, more groups across Canada, like Alberta and BC and Ontario. So really great to have so many joining us live today. New Jersey as well. Big shout out to Mr. Greenfield. Very cool. Um, all right, let's bring another live classroom in here. So I'm going to bring in Miss Wafer. Miss Wafer is joining us. She is representing her uh, Laurel Springs, so a virtual online school. How are you doing today, Ms. Wafer? I am well, thank you. And we have 115 students in a virtual classroom. They're talking with each other. They're very excited about the event and they're also feeding me questions. So I do have some questions. Um, Mika lives in Hawaii. She's in eighth grade and she's wondering what the difference is between how long they live in the wild and how long they live in captivity. And Jacob's question is kind of similar. How quickly do they grow? How long does it take for them to become adults? Well, um, kind of growing quickly and becoming an adult is almost two separate questions. Uh, they grow quickly very fast. Um, Kieran, when he was born, he weighed 140 pounds. And basically mom's milk is so rich and he drinks so much of it in a day that he would put on five pounds every day. So it did not take long for him to reach 400 pounds. It has not taken too long for him to weigh now over 2,600 pounds. So he's basically half the size of his dad and he's only two and a half years of age. But being fully grown, uh, or even reaching sexual maturity doesn't happen for a male greater one horn rhino until they're about 10 years of age. So he's got more weight to put on, more height to have happen uh, before he would be in the wild with other adult males chasing down that female for an opportunity to breed. As far as their life expectancy, it actually is fairly similar. Um, oftentimes, however, you know, with the free food, no predators, no, you know, drama. If he gets sick, we've got veterinarians. So all of those factors can kind of help um, increase the longevity that they do live in. But rhinos in the wild, assuming they don't get poached or have uh, any, you know, massive disease or drought or flooding or anything, they can live just as long. And, and they're actually finding that these guys are living anywhere into their uh, 30s and 40s. And sometimes some have made it even into their 50s. It's pretty spectacular. All right, I'm going to bring another classroom in live here. This time we're going to go to Thunder Bay, uh, Ontario. Let me turn on their microphone. How are we doing, Thunder Bay? Oops, it looks like I'll have to get you to unmute for me uh, on your end. Can you unmute for me? I can't, uh, I can't unmute your mic. You'll have to do it on your end. Perfect. Sorry about that. Sorry. Oh, no, don't worry about it. All right, we got someone ready to go. 
Do rhinos only grow hair on their tails and ears? Technically, yes, although their eyelashes are considered to be hair. And do you guys know what their horn is made of? Who can tell me that? What do you think, grade five? Shout it out if you know. Keratin! Keratin, you got it. Good job, everybody. So keratin is actually a protein that is the same protein that makes up our own hair and fingernails. So technically, the horn would be another... Not exactly hair, but it is the same protein that makes it up as well. But yep, other than that, they're totally naked. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got a question online here from Sadie. Sadie's in Hutchinson, Kansas. And she wants, she really likes the sound that they make when they eat and wants to know about any other sounds that they make. So there's been about 10 different recorded vocalizations for the greater one horn rhino. I have only heard three maybe four. Um, so I, I don't know all 10. The biggest one that we will hear um, from this kiddo all the time is when, uh, when I was talking about those cubes, because each rhino gets a specific amount based on their weight, we actually do separate these two in order to eat their cubes. So when he's done his little portion, he will start mooing because he now wants over to eat mom's cube. Mom is still eating and I'm not eating. So he's getting all bent out of shape because he would still like to be eating. So he does kind of like a mm, mm, when he's impatient. Uh, it's a baby call that he would make to mom. You know, he's done it since he was born. So that's the communicative baby moo. Um, I've also heard roaring and we hear that during the breeding and often the male, um, he will start shouting as he's chasing the female around the exhibit. And we'll often get calls from different areas of the zoo. Are you guys breeding your rhinos? Because they can hear this weird roaring that doesn't happen often. Uh, when Asha Kieran is in a heat, she also makes a particular noise. Um, I think they call it like a pant squeak, but it's kind of like a whoop choo, whoop choo. And that's a big signal indicator for males. Uh, it helps us as well know that she's in her heat cycle. And we've got that already. Um, so those are the real main three that I've heard as a vocalization. All right. I'm going to bring Mrs. Point. Laws. Mrs. Laws is joining us in North Carolina. Uh, let me make sure I unmute here. All right, we'd love a question. Yes, um, my kids are wondering how many babies can one female have in her lifetime? How long is the gestation period? And do they mate for life? Do not mate for life, definitely not. Uh, dads actually have zero part in raising the calves. They basically do their job and move along. Um, so it's basically up to mom to care for them. And I have to remember all your questions. Um, so gestation for a rhino is about 16 months. So it's a very long pregnancy and calves are born anywhere from about hundred to 150 pounds. So he was on the heavier end. Um, well, sorry, what was your other question? You had great questions. Uh, I think it was, uh, how many in oh, a lifetime? Yes. So that's, there's no hard, fast rule about how many, uh, they would have. What I can tell you is they're pregnant for 16 months, then they give birth, they nurse their baby from anywhere from a year and a half to two years. And then in the wild, mom would probably keep that baby around a little bit, but at about the two year mark, she's now going to go ahead and get pregnant again. So that calf has maybe another 16 months to kind of hang out with mom before she's going to either chase it off completely or it's gonna to have to stay on the periphery of her. She won't be able to, the calf won't be able to live with her all the time as she's getting ready to have that new baby but it still may hang around in the bushes because it might not be like ready to just kind of head out on its own yet. Um, so I'm not entirely sure exactly how many they could have, but they're really only having babies every four years or so. And that's one of the reasons why poaching is so detrimental to rhinos is the long gestation and caring for a period. If you're only having a, a baby once every four years or so, um, you know, the death of one rhino at some point will severely impact the total population very quickly because they just don't reproduce fast. Okay. So I've got a question from some grade sevens who are, who are in a virtual classroom and they're wondering about the predators of the greater one horned rhino. Uh, do they have any thoughts? I'd love to know what they think might be a predator. Okay. Uh, grade sevens, if you're still online or anybody for that matter, uh, yeah. send in some messages via the, the chat and we'll see what some of those thoughts are. So it's, there's about a 10 second delay. So we'll give them a second to see sure. what people start putting in for us. 
Uh, I'll just give some other statistics in that talking about predators. Um, you're going to want to think about where these animals are from. So as I said, they're basically, they live in India and Nepal. So what other animals live in that area? Um, Ash Kieran currently weighs uh, 4,100 pounds. So it definitely have to be big and strong. Right. All right. A few are coming in. Our sure. first kind of guess is, um, oh, well, yeah, there's some good ones coming in. So humans came in. Uh, lions is another uh, one that came in. Um, a few guessed hyenas and cheetahs, but not quite in the right spot. Snakes. Well, that's interesting. Grade five, six is think maybe snakes, tigers. Who and, said tigers? Yeah. So the greater one horn rhino really does not have many natural predators. Um, being that they are so large, really the only thing that is going to get predated would be a young calf. So if a, a, a small baby strayed from mom, they're basically subjected now to the potential of being predated uh, by tigers. And tigers are what live in India, um, not unfortunately lions or the cheetahs who are, uh, and hyenas. You guys were right with certain rhino species. Those definitely are what the black and white rhinos have to watch out for. But these guys in particular, it's mainly tigers. But whoever said humans, ding, 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 guys, that is their main unnatural predator. Um, and I say unnatural because technically we really have no reason to be killing rhinos. We're not eating them for food, um, where the tigers definitely would try to be eating them for food. But there's no way that a tiger would even be able to take down, I don't think, even a, 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 the size of a rhino that's Kieran's size at the moment. Um, they just they don't hunt in a pack. They're usually solitary. Um, so they really would need a, a young calf, a newborn. Maybe that mom didn't know how to take care of it and it was by itself or mom wasn't looking. Um, and that would be the opportunity for the tiger. But generally, for the most part, they really don't have a natural predator except humans. All right. I'm going to bring in another live classroom that we have joining us here. So we've got uh, Miss B joining us. She is representing her fifth graders in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. How are you doing today? We are doing really good. My kiddos are tuning in. They are all so excited. Um, yesterday, we attended a presentation on elephants. And so they're making some great connections between rhinos and elephants. And something that surprised us today was we were under the impression that maybe rhinos had a little bit of ivory in their hands, and that may have been why people wanted to hunt them. Um, but you shocked us with what they're really made of. And so I guess our question is really what, what is the value of that rhino horn and why is it so, why is it so valuable? So that's a fantastic question and excellent to point out. So unlike elephants, uh, the only ivory these animals have is their teeth uh, inside their heads. And basically that's what an elephant's tusks are, is an extension of a few teeth that grow. So the horn is made of keratin, which is like that um, fingernail hair protein. And the value is, you know, unvaluable to a rhino. They need this horn. Um, as I said, they don't use it for uh, fighting, but they do use it for other things. Um, oftentimes they'll dig around in mud for minerals, they'll eat or drink the water in those muddy areas. And in order to get at that, they're gonna use that horn to kind of dig stuff up. As far as the value to humans, again, there is no value, except we've now created a value um, based upon basically uh, traditional medicines. So Southeast Asian traditional medicine has used rhino horn as a cure for various ailments. And this has actually been going on for centuries. Unfortunately, it wasn't too much of a problem until really about 2007. And at that time, a Vietnamese figurehead made a claim that rhino horn would cure cancer. And that unfortunately escalated poaching exponentially. By the time seven years had elapsed, or in that same year that uh, the, the claim was made, only 13 rhinos had been poached in the entire year. And that's it for their horns. By 2014, just seven years later, 1,215 animals were killed in that year alone based on the claim that rhino horn would cure cancer. So it's been exceptionally tragic. It ends up being over three rhinos every single day killed for their horns. And um, unfortunately, it is a myth. As I said, it's made of a, like fingernail and hair material. So if that actually cured cancer, we could chew our own fingernails and our own hair. Science also has taken it a step further and they have proven that rhino horn will not cure cancer. 
So to me, it's actually very tragic that that claim was even made because there were a lot of people paying crazy amounts of money for rhino horn because it is illegal to buy it, sell it, or own it. So this is all done illegally on the black market. And um, those poor people who were thinking they were going to get cured from cancer probably did not. And so they probably forsook proper treatments uh, and instead went the traditional route. So unfortunately, I need everyone's help out there today to help me perpetuate uh, the fact that rhino horn does not cure cancer. It doesn't cure any ailments. Uh, the only thing it does is help a rhino look super good, right? All right. They look much better with their horns. Much better with their horns. It's amazing. $60,000 a kilogram is, is the number that we've heard a few times today. Yes, um, it's insane. Absolutely crazy. All right. Let's visit a few more of our classrooms again. So, Ms. Wafer, do you have uh, some more questions from your crew? I do. And so Olivia lives in Nevada. She's in fourth grade. And I think we've covered a lot about the babies, but I'm not sure if we found out how long do their parents care for them uh, before they let them go. She's wondering about that. So rhino babies uh, actually depends on the species. So if you're a white rhino calf, you're actually going to stay with mom and family a little bit longer. Um, white rhinos are the most social of all the rhino species, and they actually like to hang out together. So oftentimes, uh, moms and daughters, as they grow up, they kind of hang out in the same vicinity, and that's called a crash. And they'll often travel together and so on. Um, these guys are totally solitary. So totally on mom to care for the calf. She nurses them anywhere from two to two and a half years. And as I said earlier, they may just kind of hang out with mom on in the background or off to the side, because by the time this calf is weaned, the mom is going to go ahead and um, breed again. And that first baby will have about 16 months that he can still stay with mom. And then by the time the new baby is coming, it's time to go. There's your teeth. All right. So we've got a question here. Uh, very curious about their lips. This is from Lucas. Yeah. Lucas wants to know, is there any bones in there? Is it all just muscle? All muscle. It's called a semi prehensile lip, and it's just a bunch of flesh that's super strong. And as you saw, he's able to use that lip to grab tree branches and bushes. So I'll pretend that I'm a tree way up here, and he's going to use that lip to get that in his mouth just like that. So just like a finger, they're able to use that lip. So it's super handy for them to be able to reach up and grab those trees and bushes. You might have noticed how flexible his neck is, that he can look way up. White rhinos don't have that flexibility and they don't eat trees and bushes either. Their heads are big and heavy, low to the ground and they can't bend their necks just like these guys can. So this lip is fairly unique. Uh, actually four of the five species have it. So it's really the white rhinos that have the more unique lips and the white rhinos have lips that look like their bottom, but the same as on the top. So they're just flat, two flat lips. All right, excellent tree impression, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we're going to go back to Surrey, British Columbia, see if they have another question for us. Everybody, Yes, we did have one more question. Excellent. We were one, wondering why the teeth are located so far back in their mouth and not more near the front. I guess it's kind of similar to us. Our molars are all in the back. Um, they don't have any, these are the only species that have the incisors or canines here in the bottom but they don't use that to chew. Um, and I guess just based on the shape of their head and maximizing the amount of molars they have, you kind of have to start further back. It's not really too far in the grand scheme of things. Like there's the first little tooth there and he's still young as well. He still will have some that grow in. You don't <laughs> play with my lips, but not like that. I get it. Okay, crazy kid. Yeah, so they're just, I think it's just the way the skull is um, designed. Also the amount of food, as you saw, as they keep eating those sticks, they just kind of go further and further and further back into their mouth. So you want to make sure everything's good and chewed before you swallow it. All right, let's pop back to Thunder Bay, see if they have one more. Hi. Yep. No, we got you, I unmuted. Is it, we're good? No, you're good, yeah. Okay, so we were wondering, because we all live in Ontario, and we know how we can get really cold. So yeah. Barry wants to ask his question. What do we do where what they do then in winter? In the winter time, what happens to the rhinoceroses? That is a great question. Uh, Thank you. So yes, they don't have much hair and it gets chilly for them in the winter and they're not huge fans because these guys are from very tropical climates. 
Oh, so if you see, I'm just going to interrupt, and Ash is doing something very natural right now. She's headed to the wallow to cool down. Uh, it is a nice warm day here, and get out of the way, kids. <laughs> She's going to have a bath. Um, Kieran may run away from us in a minute as he realizes that she's headed to the wallow without him. Sometimes he is still a baby and he'll freak out and be like, wait, where's mom? And need to run away. Um, however, so here at the Toronto Zoo, we have to take that into consideration. So obviously we can't leave them outside. They'll get way too cold. So we actually have indoor exhibits for them that uh, we've built. So you can come and see the greater one horn rhinos on display all year round. R right. All right. I'm going to pop in a question here from Mrs. Laws that she just put into the chat for us. Um, uh, can you remind us how many individuals there are at the zoo and do you have any other rhino species? Great question. Yeah. So we have three greater one horned rhinos. Uh, we're mainly set up to be a breeding facility. So we have two adults permanently here, male and female. We have some kids, they stay for a bit and then they move on to other facilities to continue the genetic diversity that is needed in a zoo environment. Um, so we have three greater one horned rhinos and being that they're not a social species, we really can't house many more than that because um, we just don't have the proper space to give females, multiple females, some space. And we'd never really house multiple males ever together. There'd be too much fighting. However, Toronto Zoo, we're very lucky. Oh, did you hear that? Might do it again. Here's a vocal. This is mooing. You're also seeing, oh my goodness, so many things to look at. So Ashley Kieran is properly wallowing. She's uh, ro rolling around in the mud in the wallow. She's getting covered in mud to help uh, keep, keep flies off of her and cool her down. Sorry, they distract me. Um, what were you we saying? White yeah, white rhinos, right. So we're really lucky here at the zoo. We house two species of the remaining five left on the planet. Um, and I'm really proud of that fact. I think it's fantastic. So we do have white rhinos as well. White rhinos being more social, we have two adult females. We have a two and a half year old as well. His name is Theo. He was born here um, and that's the first to his mom, Zahari. So we've got two females and the little calf that live together um, during the daytime and they're our proper crash. And then we also have Tom and he's the breeding male. Um, he really now only goes out with the females um, during a breeding session. Uh, we don't like to take any chances you know, he may not hurt Tom, but we would not want to take that chance. So until Tom is actually properly separated from his mom and his aunt, um, sorry, as soon as Theo is separated from his mom and aunt, Tom really won't be able to hang with the ladies. But before Tom's birth, he would. He would be able to go out with the two girls and they would either, yes, you can come and hang out with us or no, you better keep your distance today. But it's a pretty neat dynamic that you can have multiple um, white rhinos together. All right, Miss B, let's check in with you one more time. You have another question from your group? Yeah, we the first reaction a lot of us had as we were watching these rhinos being fed was, why are they not biting you? It kind of shocked <laughs> us that you were able to put your hand right in their mouth and not be bit. And so is there ever a reason that a rhino would bite for defensive reasons or why aren't you getting bit? <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not getting bit. I'll say that. Yeah. Right. We are too. <laughs> um, my hand looks like it's really going in a lot farther than it is. Um, although by the look of my arm, it looks like it's all the way in. Um, they don't really bite as a defensive mechanism. Um, if they were upset, they might swing their head at me with those teeth. Um, but I think that for the most part, don't get me wrong, anything that I've done here with these rhinos, I would not take a vacation to India or Nepal and pop out of my little, you know, uh, sightseeing tour bus and start petting a rhino. Um, not in a million years. All of these rhinos that we have here at the Toronto Zoo have been born in a zoo. Ash here is actually born uh, at the Buffalo Zoo. Vishnu was born at the Bronx Zoo and they came here to make some Canadian babies. So I'm here hanging out with us now. Nice to see you. You're going to get a better look at her big teeth in the front here compared to Kieran's and the dads are even bigger than that. So it's crazy. Um, but not having much teeth in her mouth, I can stick my hand in between those two sharp ones and there's not much in there other than kind of a, a bite plate at the top. So they don't really have the desire to bite me. Um, we have a really good relationship. I do a lot of training with them and that helps. And I also do a lot of petting with them, which they love. So that makes it feel except when they're all muddy like this. Ugh. So <laughs> she's gone and covered herself nicely in the wallow and that's gonna help to keep the flies and bugs off of her. Ugh. 
All right. Well, Angie, thank you so much. That was so cool to get to meet uh, both of the rhinos, get to learn a little bit about them, see some behaviors. That was pretty awesome too. Um, yeah, so a huge thank you to you for joining us today. Uh, Thanks all of you out there for wanting to participate. I'm super excited. Um, yay, World Rhino Day. I hope I have helped everyone to appreciate that these animals are amazing and that they need our help. And without our help, they're going to go extinct for sure. So we have to be their, their voices. We have to let everyone know their horns are not medicine. Um, rhinos need their horn. They need space. And we just need to start living in a little more harmony with them. Absolutely. So um, a great way to wrap up today would be learning a little bit more about how classrooms, students, how can they follow along with what's going on at the zoo? Where can they learn more? Where can you send us? That is an excellent question. And I'm going to pass you over to someone who will have way more information than I do about that. I'm going to introduce you to Mary Ellen, and she's part of our learning and engagement department. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and get to uh, participate and tell you guys a little bit more about where you can find out more information about how you can get involved in other programs at the zoo. So as simple as that is you can go to any of our social media pages, just at the Toronto Zoo on Facebook, Instagram. We have a TikTok as well. I know we're super hip. Um, and also head over to our website, specifically go to Toronto Zoo, Zoo to You page. You're able to find out about all of our classroom virtual field trips that we've just launched, as well as stick around with Explore by the Seat of Your Pants for the next couple of months. We'll be doing our weekly video or monthly video, sorry, with them here. Um, on their page to so check it out. We're gonna head all around the zoo, as well as we have several other videos that we posted uh, that are already on the Explore by the Sea Deer Pants uh, YouTube page that we did earlier uh, this year uh, before the summertime as well. So check out all those videos, head over to the Toronto Zoo YouTube page and our website as well to find out lots more programs that you can get involved in. All right, awesome, Mary Ellen, thank you so much. Again, thank you to everybody who tuned in on YouTube from across North America. So great to have so many groups joining. We even had someone tuning in from India and a few other countries. Um, thank you so much, Angie. Such good information. Thank you for the work you do at the zoo. Uh, and everybody behind the scenes, thanks for making today possible. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Have a great day. Happy All World right. Rhino Day. Happy World Rhino Day. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Check out our YouTube channel to find all the events from this morning. We had some amazing events from the field, so check those out. All right. Thanks again, everyone. We're going to sign off for today.